Hello, everyone. Welcome to part one of the arts education advocacy cycle series. Uh, very, very happy you're joining us today. My name is Adelaide Kuhn and I am program director at Create California. I'm really looking forward to connecting with some of you in breakout rooms and hearing from you during the Q&A. Before we get into our welcomes and presentation activities, et cetera, um, we all need to get signed on to our correct language channel. So please, um, first, let's say hi to our interpreters. We have Heidi and Sagradio joining us today and helping out with the Spanish language interpretation. So Heidi and Sagradio, you wanna say hi? Hi, hola. <laughs> I can go ahead and say what you just said, Adelaide, uh, and then just we'll just jump into the instructions if you like. Just want to make sure that the Spanish speakers hear what what you what you said about yourself. Perfect. Thanks, and we can advance to the next slide with the instructions as well. Uh, Adelaide se estaba presentando. Ella les da la bienvenida a todos en la serie número uno de la defensa y conocimiento en las artes y la educación. En unos momentos les vamos a dar las las instrucciones para acceder a la interpretación simultánea. Great. So first, um, you will see, as, as displayed on this slide, the interpretation uh, webinar control, the circle with the lines through it. You'll click on that icon. You will see your language options, English and Spanish. Select your preferred language and you're good to go. You can also, there's an option to mute original audio, which will be helpful in helping you only hear the, um, the interpreted language. If you have any questions about the interpretation, about anything else, um, please raise your Zoom hand or ask a question in the chat. We will help you to the best of our ability. En un momento van a activar la acción de interpretación. Ustedes pueden ver en su pantalla. Aún no, pero cuando la activen, si están ustedes acompañándonos por computadora, ustedes verán un globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Si están acompañándonos por teléfono o por tableta, verán tres puntos o la palabra more. Al apretar esta, esta figura, ustedes van a encontrar el lenguaje donde ustedes van a seleccionar inglés o español y necesitamos que apague el audio original. Si viene por teléfono, asegúrese de apretar Done para que se active la acción. Y uh, si tienen problemas con la interpretación, levanten la mano a través de, la, de Zoom y nosotros le vamos a poder ayudar de esa forma. Thank you so much, Heidi. Okay, so I will now activate it so you'll be able to see the globe. And here we all go. Please select your language. Seleccione su lenguaje ahora. Excellent. All right. I am now very happy to hand it over to my colleague, Tom DeCaney, Executive Director of Create California, to welcome you all. Thanks, Adelaide. Um, What's well, my great honor today to welcome you all to our session. Um, we're so grateful that you're taking the time to join us and for your effort to make sure that every student in the state of California gets a high quality education that includes the arts. So thank you so much for everything you're doing out in the field and for being with us today. Um, I want to thank our partners for today's webinar, Arts for LA, um, the Arts Education Alliance of the Bay Area. Um, I'm based in San Francisco, so I know them well. Um, and our partners at the California State PTA. So we appreciate everybody coming together for what's a super important year in public education in California. Um, all of us, we know it's been very difficult um, for parents, families, students, teachers, uh, everybody in public education. Um, and we wanna make sure that students recover and get the education they deserve and need to be able to recover from this pandemic and to uh, make sure that they're set up for success. So, and I also wanna thank our board member, Jesus, who's gonna be one of our presenters today and for all of his leadership on our board. Um, um, such an incredible opportunity to have you here today. Thank you, Jesus. Um, and for those that don't know, Create California is recently a merged entity between the former California Alliance for Arts Education and Create California. And so we're thrilled to have come together under the Create California brand um, and to be supporting uh, advocacy and policy for arts education across the state. 
Um, so with that, it's my great honor to pass it over to one of our partners. Um, I'm gonna introduce Carol Green, who's the president of the California State PTA. I'll let you take it away, Carol. Thanks, Tom, and welcome everyone. It's so exciting to be um, virtually um, screenside with all the parents, students, and community activists. California State PTA has known for almost its entire 125 years that supporting and advocating for the arts is essential for all of our students and really for our society. Arts education advocacy workshops will help you understand how to ensure that your child and every child in California gets the arts education that they deserve. And California State PTA has been advocating for a full curriculum, including the arts, um, for more than 100 years. We know that arts education is so important, really vital to all of our students, particularly after the difficult time that we've had during and as we continue in the pandemic. Um, we know that the arts are a great place for um, social, emotional well-being, as well as creativity and all the great things that come with that. And we're happy to partner with you. And we know that you as parents and as advocates are the ones that can drive home the point to our school board members and to our schools how important the arts are. So thank you so much for being here. And um, I'm looking forward to learning lots of great things. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Tom and Carol. Uh, before we get started, I want to take a moment to center race and equity in our conversation and to work to create an e inclusive space by acknowledging the land of Indigenous people that we all live, work, and stand on in this moment. In the chat, we are sharing a link to the Create California land acknowledgement and resources to help you identify whose land you are on in this moment. And we would like to now take a moment to, to pause and have everyone who is comfortable doing so, please share an acknowledgement of indigenous land in the chat. Thank you to everyone who is sharing those acknowledgements. In closing, I'd like to say that in order for a land acknowledgement to be truly meaningful, for it to be more than a, a performative gesture, we as individuals and collectively as organizations need to advocate for indigenous sovereignty and the return of stolen lands. So to learn more about one collective that is doing this work, you can visit the website of the Land Back Movement. There is a short film, it's about three minutes long, Long, um, on that website that I'm about to put in um, about the work of the Land Back Movement. I highly recommend you view it and learn more about how you can support um, this effort. So here is that website. It's landback.org. Excellent. Thank you. Next, we're going to move on to a set of meeting agreements that we created in September with our local arts education organizers that Create California works with, the Arts Now leaders. Um, and this was uh, a, a list that was to sort of to set ground rules, so to speak, for the meetings that they the organizers have throughout the year. Um, I'll just read these bullets quickly. Assume positive intent while also checking for impact know when to step up or step back, challenge the idea, not the person, show up with authenticity and be generous with praise. And these are just points to keep in mind, especially when we move into to breakout groups. We really want this space to be safe for everyone to learn, grow and share. 
So with that, uh, I will would now like to have each of our invited speakers take a moment to introduce themselves quickly. So I will pass it to Isha first. Hi, I'm Isha. I'm a student from Mission San Jose High School, um, and I'm an advocate for arts equity here in Create, California. Great. Can we pass it over to you, Stephanie? Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie. I am a current freshman at Gonzaga University. And when I was back home, um, I was a student trustee. Thanks, Stephanie. Jesus, can you go next? Yes, thank you so much. My name is Jesus Oguin. I'm a school board member with the Moreno Valley Unified School District in Riverside County. Also serving as the president of the Riverside County School Board Members Association, member of Create California and also of California PTA supporter of the arts. Thank you. Thanks, Jesus. Ishtaka is gonna be joining us a little bit later. They'll introduce themselves. Um, they'll be facilitating the Q&A. Great, so quickly, I now wanna run through our agenda. We're gonna start with some level setting about LCFF and LCAP. Make sure everyone knows what those abbreviations mean and why they're so important. Next, we will support everyone in locating their local control and accountability plan document. From there, we will move to some tips and tricks that will help you before you start reading your plan. In breakout groups, we will do a, a keyword scavenger hunt. Take a quick break, very important. Um, we'll then complete another activity that helps connect the arts to the LCFF priorities. And we're gonna leave a generous amount of time at the end for Q&A with key decision makers. That is the plan. Um, before I pass it over, I want to once again, make sure everyone's sorted out with the interpretation. I'm gonna put some instructions in the chat right now to make sure everyone has selected their language, anyone who's just joining us. And with that, it is my pleasure to pass it on um, to Cordelia Estelle, my colleague at Arts for LA. She's director of organizing and she's gonna lay some groundwork um, for you all on the local control funding formula. Awesome. Um, so glad to be here with all of you. Um, incredible group of activists and advocates. Um, I'm Cordelia Estelle, uh, director for the Arts for LA, as Cordelia said, um, and deeply passionate about this part of our work at Arts for LA. Um, I always like to, to ground these trainings in, in the acknowledgement also that the arts saved my life as a student, um, for sure. Um, and uh, really, uh, it's, it's, it's a joy, privilege, and honor to be here with all of you. All right, let's talk LCFF. Let's get into some uh, some alphabet soup, some acronyms, um, and try and tease out uh, what they are and why they're important to our work as uh, organizers and advocates. Um, the LCFF, uh, this is uh, a four letters you're gonna hear quite a bit today um, and in the ongoing work uh, to, to ensure equitable arts education across California and beyond. Um, LCFF stands for the Local Control Funding Formula, and this is the formula that decides how districts are funded, right? Um, and some quick history and context, I think it's helpful in, in framing what it is and why it's important um, to our work. Um, so I, I always like to remember when we're talking about the LCFF, the Local Control Funding Formula, and then the LCAP, which we'll talk about in a second, um, that they're pretty new. We're within the first decade of this system of funding and school district planning and budgeting being rolled out. So this was um, a com complete overhaul of the way California state funded uh, local school districts in, and it was passed in 2013 um, and sort of rolled out in 2013-14. Again, so we're, we're within the first 10 years of this system. Um, and I think that's helpful to remember as advocates as we're continuing to innovate and try new tactics um, in, in influencing uh, the, these processes and ensuring the arts are meaningful, meaningfully included in local budgets and local district plans. Um, so the local control funding formula is again, how the state of California determines how each district is going to, um, how much money it's gonna get allocated quite simply. And it would really, 
uh, the overhaul had three main goals. So the, the local control funding formula um, and the LCAP, again, the local control and accountability plan, which we'll talk in a second, really have three big goals in mind. Um, and those goals are one, to make funding more equitable. Um, two, to empower local, local school districts, local communities, local district leaders um, to make decisions that are gonna be specific and responsive to the needs on the ground in their district. Um, and then the third one was to expand the metrics by which we evaluate district performance um, and, and, and sort of be a little more holistic in how we think about um, success um, and successful um, outcomes at, at the district level. So those are the big three things. Um, and the way it works, right? So it, historically, it's still in a lot of places, and in California up to the 70s, school district uh, budgets were determined by local property taxes, right? Meaning that affluent areas, typically the property taxes, right, um, were gonna be, were gonna result in more revenue. And so affluent areas were gonna have more funding for public schools. That just wasn't really equitable. It was leaving a lot of students behind um, and there was an attempt in the 70s to sort of address this issue. Um, and we, we don't have to get into the details of it, but the LCFF was the sort of second attempt um, real overhaul to, to really center equity in funding and ensure that we are prioritizing students with, with the most needs um, in terms of funding and getting resources where they're really most needed. So the way it works, there are basically three kinds of funding. And I'm just going to go through them again so that if you hear these words as we're talking through all of this in the context of your district and the advocacy you're doing, um, you have some sense of, of what they mean, right? Um, so the first, the first thing to know about a district, uh, the local control funding formula, is that every district receives a base grant, right? So every school district in California is given a base grant. And that's um, an amount of money that is dependent on how many students are in the district, right? So every district gets money from California, the state of California, based on how many students are attending school in that school district. Then there's a supplemental fund, right? And that is what you see here in this slide, and that's what this slide is really breaking down. The supplemental fund is funding that is based on the needs of students in the district, right? So it's additional funding for every student who falls into these three categories, who is an English language learner, who is in foster care, and who is low income. That population of students is, um, I think somewhat confusingly, referred to as unduplicated students. I didn't realize for a long time what that term meant. It's just the way sort of the system refers to these three categories of students. English language learners, uh, foster care students, and low-income students. And unduplicated, it just means that there are going to be many students who may, fit it, may be in multiple categories, right? It might be an English language learner who is low-income or in foster care um, and an English language learner. However, the funding system only counts that student once, not twice. So that's how supplemental funding is allocated through the local control funding formula. The last piece is concentration funds, right? So we have the base grant. Every district gets a certain amount of funding based on how many students are in the district. Supplemental funding based on how many students are English language learners, foster youth, or low income. And then districts where 55% of students, 55 or more uh, percent of students are classified as English language learners, foster youth, or low income receive additional funding, right? And this funding can be spent um, on services that are addressed are really aimed at closing the equity gap specifically. Um, there's some, a lot of flexibility in how this funding can be spent as long as the case is made convincingly by the district um, that this funding is directly going to closing this equity gap. And as this incredible slide uh, notes, it's, it's really important for us to sort of be aware of this um, because many school board members, many decision leaders, uh, decision makers at the district level don't know that this funding can be can go towards our construction, towards our staff, um, and our program. Um, and we, we know that the arts close um, are, are help a are key, key critical part of closing equity gap. Um, and so it's just about us as advocates making sure um, that this is understood as a really important tool within any district, um, you know, uh, tool built 
you will, um, uh, and, and can be leveraged. Okay, so that's the local control funding formula. That, that's how the money is distributed to districts across the state. Uh, the LCAP stands for the Local Control and Accountability Plan. And the idea is if the state of California is saying, okay, we want to empower um, local districts to really make decisions based on the specific needs that you know, you know best as a district and the decision makers in the district better than we can potentially on the state level. That's great and we wanna do that, but you need to tell us what you're doing and you need to be able to show us how you're gonna spend all of these different sources of money. And that is the LCAP, right? So it's both a reporting document and also a planning tool for the district. And this um, is, is really, really a, a place that is was intention is intention. The intention was um, to make multiple entry points for community members to have impact over district planning and budgeting processes. That was the goal, um, and so it's really crucial that we understand these key leverage points in the LCAP cycle as our advocates, so that we can make our voices heard and make sure every student has access to the arts education that is their right. Right. So the LCAP happens, basically the cycle is three, every three years, the district has to write their local control and accountability plan, right? Um, and then every year that plan gets revised. So we get a bite at the apple every year. Um, and the cycle is about to start up, which is why you are all at this training um, and why we will uh, be coming back to you with more resources and more um, uh, virtual training opportunities as the process unfolds, just to make sure you have everything you need to have impact at your uh, at your district level. Um, and so the LCAP, what is it? It's a local control and accountability plan. Again, I keep saying it because it, it helps. I think um, to sort of again demystify some of these some of these acronyms. Um, the local control and accountability plan, or LCAP, uh, has to include. Um, priorities, right, that are set out by the California Department of Education. These are around graduation dropout rates, it's around community engagement, how engaged are students and parents with the school system or the learning, the local education agency, um, how's the attendance, right? Um, and then English language proficiency, as well as academic metrics. Um, and I'm just going to drop this into the chat because I always, always, always recommend people check out uh, sort of Play around with your, um, with the, sorry, hold on one second, no, I guess in the chat, with the California State Dashboard, right? So this is a resource that reports back these metrics um, as aggregated um, at the state level. You can, you can go and search your district and see how your district is doing along all of these measures. Um, you can also break it down by the groups of, um, by various sort of measures and metrics and student demographics. Um, and so it can be a really informative tool for advocates in sort of seeing where your district is, is um, where their issues maybe your di district needs to address um, and where your district is, is, is really excelling and serving its students and its families and its community. So just want to get that into that because I think it's a really useful tool. Um, all right. So again, I mentioned this quickly, but it, it really is worth emphasizing. The LCAP system was designed to enable more powerful community engagement and meaningful community engagement. School boards, before they approve the LCAP, which they're the school boards, the elected officials, right, the elected decision makers in your district have final approval over the proposed LCAP. Um, and they have to run it by the community first, right? There's a, an extended process. This plan is developed in coordination with administrators, with the superintendent, with input from teachers, with input from um, students, maybe not enough input from students always, that's what we're here to push for. Um, but again, baked into the process is a requirement that school boards consult with community. Um, so there will, there will be a public meeting where you get to weigh in to what uh, should be on your LCAP, that you think should be on your LCAP. Um, and, and that is, again, a key leverage points, and there are many others along the way, right? Um, but at the, at the very least, there will be a public meeting um, where you, as an arts advocate, can stand up and say, this is what we want to see in the process. And we'll get into the details of all the other places you can plug into the process and have impact. Um, but again, there's, there's going to be um, always at least, you know, a, a, a time and place where you can 
tell your elected decision makers this is what we want. Um, and I think with that, is there anything else I didn't cover that feels like essential um, to move forward with the training? Yeah, no, I think you got it. Thank you so much, Cordelia. Awesome. So now we're going to talk about how to locate your LCAP. So you can search your district's website. The LCAPs must be posted online by your district. And if not, you can always call your district. So we are gonna try this out. Um, please go ahead and try this out with me. I have already prepped two different districts and I'm gonna show you what their websites look like, but you can simply Google your district to find their website and then try to find and locate the 21 to 22 LCAP on your district's website. So I'm gonna exit out of this screen very quickly. Hopefully technology is in my favor. And I am going to pull up this district, Rosemead. So I actually do live in Rosemead, California. And as you can see, here's the website. So now I'm gonna search around and see what I can find. As you can see, it's in our district. I'm gonna click budget. And here we go. We see it is located right here. Pull this up. And this is the LCAP for this district. It is pretty lengthy. And then for another reference here is Sacramento City Unified School District. Um, so how I got here was I clicked menu. As you see, there's a lot of different options. It was also under our district. I went to LCAP. And then it brought me right here. So I am going to give y'all just a few moments to locate your LCAP for your district. Um, don't feel rushed because we will have extra time for you to be able to search and then go through your LCAP. And I see in the chat, it does, yes. It, it can take some time and some searching. Um, so don't get discouraged. Um, we are here to help and you will be able to find this, I promise. So let me go and share this back to present mode. Perfect. So if you start to find your LCAP, you can just you know put in the chat that you found it. Um, if not, don't worry, we are gonna have some more time. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Isha. So I know staring at your um, LCAP document can definitely be very overwhelming, but it's good to remember um, some key features that all LCAPs have because um, there's uh, usually a standard template that's issued by the California Department of Education. Um, so LCAP encompasses a three-year period, but it's usually updated every year. Um, your LCAP should have a, a summary of uh, the plan. Uh, it should also contain highlights, which um, kind of like uh, identify uh, like key features, um, as well as like point out updates um, that were made which leads me to like the annual update. Um, it's a list of goals um, that uh, have like priority areas. Um, they're always like reassessed each year. Uh, your LCAP should also contain um, outcomes, actions, and services, um, which are a list of actions taken to um, achieve the goals that were stated um, uh, previously. Your LCAP should also have um, information about what the district has done to engage with stakeholders and this can take the form of surveys or also um, if your district has conducted focus groups with the community you should definitely um, pay a little bit of attention to this because districts should be engaging with their community they should be um, gaining input uh, from what the community wants in order to make decisions that you know affect the community um, your LCAP also has a list of budgeted expenditures, which is just a fancy way of saying, where is the money in your district going to? 
you can look at this information and um, base your own uh, opinions and um, make educated decisions off of this info. Um, and specific to uh, arts education, we'll be, we'll be providing a list of keywords um, you can search up in your LCAP, uh, and you can see the budget, budgeted expenditures um, associated with uh, art. There are also um, services that the district offers for unduplicated students listed on your um, LCAP. Um, and you should definitely be paying attention to those as well. So um, on your computers, you will find uh, control F or if you have a Mac, um, you should be using command F um, and a little uh, search bar will pop up on the top right corner of your computer uh, on your screen. Uh, and you can uh, type in any of these keywords uh, that catch your eye in particular. Um, for example, if you enter um, STEAM, uh, something STEAM related uh, might pop up, including uh, budgeted expenditure, expenditures, maybe your um, school district has set a goal um, containing like uh, maybe increasing uh, STEAM in curriculum. Um, so yeah, I'll give you some time to do this um, in our next activity, uh, which will actually be a breakout activity. So. Alexia will be providing a Jamboard link um, in your in the chat. Um, so you'll don't worry about like memorizing all of the words uh, that were in the slide uh, prior to this. Um, they'll all be in the Jamboard. Uh, once you receive the Jamboard link, uh, make sure to open it up, um, and you'll be put in breakout rooms where you can discuss with um, people like what you'll be uh, what you want to be searching up, um, what you think of what of the info that you find, um, and definitely like focus on the collab collaboration aspect of this. Um, getting perspectives, getting diverse perspectives is very important, um, and it can help you make uh, very informed decisions um, and advocate to your school district in a way that I believe. Um, is just beneficial for everyone. Great, thank you so much. So we will be putting y'all in breakout rooms. Um, I will share the Jamboard in a moment so you can see what that looks like. So it looks like this, it has um, the instructions, that's the keywords to search in your LCAP. So you will find your LCAP. And then after that, you will control find, um, use these different words to be able to locate um, the priorities of your district and how arts and arts education is being accounted for. And so you will answer these different questions. What words came up the most in your LCAP search? And what is one thing that you learned by doing this exercise? And if you don't know how Jamboard works, you can just create a little sticky, you type out your answer, and then you'll be able to place it on the board. Excellent. Thank you so much, Isha, for setting that up, and Alexia for the, the explanation. Um, due to the, the limitations of Zoom functionality. If you require Spanish language interpretation for this activity, please don't accept the breakout room invitation. We will have um, the interpretation in the main room and everyone else will, will go out into their breakouts. We're not able to provide interpretation within a breakout room. And with that, I will open all of the rooms. We will see you back in about Five minutes. All right, we are all back together. That was probably enough time. Not enough time, sorry. I know those are, those are long documents and a long list of words to search. Probably didn't finish, we know that. Hopefully um, you can go back and take another look. But let's just see what you found, what you came up with. Um, looking at the Jamboard, it looks like the word, the keyword art is our winner with someone finding it 38 times in their LCAP. Um, our second might be dance with 14, SEL, social emotional learning coming up 11 times. 
Someone did not find VAPA, STEAM, visual music, or performing arts at all mentioned in their document. Um, but they, the only common word they found were social and emotional. So really looks like a huge, huge range. Alexia, let's see if we can see. Oh, let's see. Someone said, has a question, but is it art or is it English language arts? That's a great, uh, great point because that sure comes up a lot, right? When you're doing your, your keyword search, you're searching for arts and it ends up being um, a part of English language arts. Let's take a look at what uh, what folks are learning. I need to pull that up on a different screen because it's a little too small for my eyes. Um, let's see, someone found that their districts has funding for all art forms. That's wonderful. Um, looks like social emotional is coming up reflection on this just being a new way to read the LCAP document. I think it's really incredibly daunting to pull up these PDFs that are, you know, often between 100, 200 pages and figuring out how, how to sort of crack them, how to get started. This keyword search is a really good way to zoom in on sections that are important, that are um, showing the content. Um, we see, I see in the chat from Lulu, didn't know that there was space, um, sorry, just learning more about, about using this document to learn more about how financial resources are distributed. Yes, this is really a, a place that makes that more transparent. Thank you all so much for, for doing that activity. We're now going to take just a quick screen break, um, go to the bathroom, eat your snack, Look at your phone, check your email, choose your own, choose your own break. We're going to just take a screen break for about three minutes and then we will all come back together and we have another activity to get into. So here we go. All right, everyone, let's come on back. I hope you feel refreshed. Important to give your eyes a break. I am now very pleased to hand things over to my colleague, Caitlin Lenoff, who is Youth Engagement Manager at Create California. And she has another activity to lead us in that will help connect the arts to the priorities of the local control funding formula. Over to you, Caitlin. Thanks so much, Adelaide. So glad to be here with all of you. Um, so the thing that we're focusing on uh, is LCAP and LCFF and also our advocacy for the arts in that process. And so it's important to take a moment and recognize what it is that you're working for. So um, this exercise is uh, identifying just really quickly one thing you would change to make your school and community a better place. So this will be um, an anonymous comment. Um, somebody's going to pop that link in the chat for us. It will pop up a Mentimeter. Uh, not quite. Oh, nope. <laughs> um, they'll pop up a Mentimeter and um, and you can put your answer there. And as I said, it'll be anonymous and then we'll see everybody start populating what they would like to change. So focusing on our advocacy can be something as simple as additional funding for the arts. It could be something very specific as um, a mental health space for students to have arts integrated learning in their lives. But go ahead and put your answers in and then we will check out people's responses. Thank you, Alexia, for facilitating this so beautifully. So we have some answers coming in, more arts, less politics, more money for the dance program, elementary music for all. That one is great. I hear a lot of, I got music in fifth grade and not again until one class in high school. More emphasis on mental wellness, comprehensive representation of all arts disciplines, culturally sustaining arts learning that, contribu that can contribute to healing our communities, yes. Beautiful. Continued focus on student-centered practice and principles of UDL throughout all course courses. 
I'm going to be in full transparency. I don't know what UDL is. Maybe you can pop that in the chat. Be able to get younger parents involved. Yes, more parent info involvement, both and more funding for arts with universal design learning. All right, thank, thank you both. More funding for arts materials. Yes, theater for mental health. Absolutely. Awareness of the importance of arts ed, education for your community, culturally relevant arts ed. So we start to see themes and emerging and a commonality for our, for our fight and our, and our voice here. So this is also a good reminder that um, working in coalition and with community members who align with your, your needs and desires is a great way to start, um, start uh, building your advocacy efforts. Uh, wonderful. Thank you all so much for, for um, participating in that. So what we're gonna do next is take those, right? We take our goals for our advocacy or overall advocacy efforts. And we think about if we're gonna present those to the school board, why they should care. And so that connection comes when we think about connecting our advocacy message to our LCFF priorities. So here they are, there are 10 of them, memorize them really quickly. Don't do that. They will be on the slide. So what we're gonna do is take, uh, take our message that hopefully is in your mind and your hearts. And we're gonna move over to another Jamboard that's gonna have these priorities laid out over two pages. And if you could take that and add a plus one under which priority you think your message or your goal falls under, then we can start thinking about where we would like to see dollars spent, where we can start advocating for more funding in terms of the LCFF priorities. So same process, sticky note, plus one, it's on two pages, it says three, it's a lie, it's two pages, and all 10 are laid out for you there. So I heard a lot of uh, parent involvement, I think there was three at least, and you can color code it if you want, we love some color coding, don't have to. We have this in bold under student engagement. Yes, thanks, Bianca. Kids make, make kids want to come to school. Yes, we're hearing from a lot of districts that they're losing student enrollment. It's a way to make a kid want to show up, a family want to stay engaged is if the kids want to be there. That's a big one. I think school climate is always, whatever, you make your decisions. I'm not gonna force you to put things, <laughs> but don't forget there's a second page. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking this time with us. You can take it. You can take a few more minutes and, and think about where these are going. But the the next step of this exercise, which I'm going to offer, that um, you know will take maybe a little bit too much time for now. But I I I, I think find it's a really helpful end to these two processes, is um, writing out your message. So your goal, paired with your LCFF priority, and your ask for the school board together in a message that um, that sort of helps combine these ideas so that if you think about presenting at a school board meeting, you sort of have a rough draft of where you're going and what it, what it is that you would like to say there and what you're asking for. So I just offer that as an exercise that you can do um, on your own time at um, uh, in your own space. Arts integration helps performance in math and other subjects. Yes, oftentimes that is a great thing to bring in. Um, districts who are prioritizing uh, language retention and math skills often will cut the arts without realizing that the arts actually support both of those things. So acknowledging those as well. Thank you all so much. And I am going to pass it to uh, Ishtaka, who I believe just joined us. Welcome, Ishtaka. We're so glad to have you here. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ichitaka. Can you hear me? Okay, fantastic. So um, just full disclosure, I'm calling in from my school's library right now. Um, I was supposed to be at home, but I, my, yeah, I wasn't able to get picked up in time. Um, so sorry about this if it, the internet come, cuts out here and there. Um, but yeah, my name is Ichitaka Lira. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and they, them. Um, I go to Albany High School. I'm a senior right now. And yeah, I'm an arts education activism intern. 
at Create California. Um, and I'm also, I also serve as a student trustee on my district's board of education. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to be here and we're gonna start the Q and A section. So I'd like to introduce, I think you all heard about them earlier, but um, I'll be asking my questions to Stephanie Garcia Avila. Uh, she uses she, they pronouns and they are a Chicana activist and a student at Gonzaga University and a former student member, I would believe. And then also Jesus M. Holguin, who um, is a Rivers County School um, board member on the Board Members Association. Um, awesome, okay. So our first question of the afternoon is, um, I'm gonna direct it to um, Stephanie and either of you can feel free to respond if you see fit. Um, but our first question is, how can students become more involved in the LCAP process? Um, I think that we're oh, well, the way that I got involved was through a teacher of mine um, and like having his support. Um, I remember he would tune into like meetings and stuff like that. And one day I just overheard um, they were talking about money and I was like interested. And he told me that I should start joining um, and I think that's what sparked it all, like little seeds and teachers who uplift students and tell them that it's possible and all that stuff. So I think that's the way that we can start. And that's the way I started. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think like, yeah, teachers are in staff and like administrators are a great first step in learning about these sorts of um, programs, especially because they're the ones that um, know all the information first and foremost. So yeah, totally, um, I totally understand where you're coming from. And then also, yeah, um, I think somebody put this in the chat. I think Adelaide put it in the chat, but yes, all of these questions came from you guys from event registration. So if you'd like, yeah, you, you can totally ask additional questions in the chat and we'll get to those um, after we get through the questions from registration. And so our second question, um, either of you can respond to this one. Um, but it is, is giving public comment the most effective way to make your message known, or are there other better ways to communicate with school board members? Well, I can, I can try and answer that question. <clears throat> I, think, I think it's a great question because uh, there's a lot of uh, sometimes confusion as to when is it that I can contact the board or the administration, the superintendent, et cetera. And I think the uh, attending the board meetings is one opportunity. And also, uh, uh, we have to keep in mind that the district has a lot of a lot of community meetings, a lot of parent meetings, either at the district side or at in several of the schools. During the year, there's a lot of opportunities for people to to be there and to be involved. Obviously, the board meeting is is a great opportunity to come and, and speak directly to the board members for three minutes. But also keep in mind that the board members are accessible to the community and you can reach out to board members anytime. You can contact them uh, and you can ask them. You can send them messages or you can solicit to have some time to meet with them and tell them exactly what you're looking for. But uh, you, have, you have a suggestion is either the board, the superintendent, your principal, your teacher, there's many ways that you can communicate and also look for those open opportunities where all the stakeholders can participate in various committee meetings scheduled throughout the entire school year and make sure, make sure that when you ask a question that you get an answer right away. The districts are making an effort to, to get back to you immediately within 24 hours reasonably, but make sure that you get an answer. And if you don't get an answer, go out to the next level or go to another uh, uh, member of staff and get your answer. And then uh, make your suggestions all the time. There's a lot of opportunities for you to communicate with the district. Definitely, absolutely. There are many ways to like reach out to um, the, the board members and yeah, not everything can be covered in one meeting. And if you don't have time, yeah, reaching out outside of meeting time um, can sometimes be the most efficient for both you and the board member. Um, and then next question, um, I will also pass this one off to Jesus, but like how can parents who don't have much time contribute to the LCAP process? Yeah, yeah that was one of the questions in the, uh, in the breakout room. 
And uh, when parents don't, don't have the opportunity, don't have the time because they're working or you know other occupations, uh, and you have to, uh, as a district, you have to give the opportunity to the, to the parents to, to respond or to communicate, whether it is via survey, through email messages, to uh, the website information, and uh, give them that opportunity to input some information either way, electronically or via a phone call or any way that they can communicate with you at uh, various times during the day. I can tell you in our district, we have an open, open line for the parents, for the community, for the students, especially to, to call the school, the school district office and tell the superintendent or staff what is it that they need, if they need information, what kind of information they need, if they have suggestions, et cetera. And the same goes for the parents. There's a lot of opportunities. We have parent ambassadors in our district that go out to the community and talk to other parents and let them know what opportunities they have, what events are coming up, what meetings are coming up so that they can attend and ask their questions or get the information, things that are happening uh, uh, through the district. And uh, one point in the previous question that I wanted to make is that when you go to the board meeting, you have three minutes. When you talk to, this, to the board members outside the board meeting, you have more than three minutes. You have plenty of time to talk to them. Definitely, definitely. Thank you for responding to that question. Um, and then another question that I will leave this open to. Oh, sorry, my <laughs> one second. Um, I was getting a phone call. Um, our, and then our next question is, um, and this can either, either one of you can answer this one, but um, what challenges do school board members and school board representatives face that advocates should be aware of? I guess I can go first. Um, there was a lot of positives of being a student trustee in my district, um, but also I was shut down a lot because of my age. Um, I was told that my voice didn't matter because I was young and I wasn't included in like special meetings or meetings in general. I would be told like our meetings were happening at least an hour prior um, of that same day. And it was a challenge to actually, I guess, feel connected. I felt as if I was used as a token rather than actually being included. Um, and yeah, it was it was definitely hard to make my voice um, heard. And my term was only for six months. Um, so it was definitely a lot to just try to, you know, be included. So if I can respond to that question um, in our district and, and uh, you know, hearing about that experience that Stephanie had, we don't want our students to go through that same experience. We strongly believe in student voice. We listen to our students and we do things, a lot of things that we do in the district are based on the students' requests, student voice. And we want to have them at the table all the time. That's why the superintendent has a student advisory council where the students can talk directly to the superintendent. And he sets up meetings during the, during the year so that they can come and speak to him. But some of the challenges that school board members are facing today is uh, <clears throat> Uh, when, when people believe that uh, some of the decisions that are being made uh, at the state level or at the federal level are decisions that the school, school, uh, school board needs to make, and sometimes it's, it's not the case. These are federal or state uh, mandates that the school board needs to follow. So when people uh, believe that the school board is the one that is making that decision, uh, it makes it very challenging for the school board to continue business. But regardless, uh, we follow the, the, uh, the guidance from the California School Boards Association and from other many different organizations and also the legal counsel to conduct our business. But one of the areas that we have to do is to open the communication for students and parents and community to talk to the board. And even, even if we have the board meetings via Zoom, we still have that open communication with the community so they can talk to us during the meeting and again, not only during the meeting, but also all the times. So the communication is open all the time. That's our requirement. And, and we are happy to listen, especially from our students. Thank you both so much for providing your perspective on that. I know that, um, yeah, a lot of school board members have to deal with a lot of extra stuff on the side. And um, yeah, I thank you for providing your perspective. Um, 
our next question, uh, I will pass this one to Stephanie, but yes, this is, you are totally welcome to respond to it. Um, so how do we create a cohesive support for the arts in our district so as to achieve expansion and equity? Um, I think just simply by funding um, our arts programs. Back home um, during my junior year, I believe, one of our academies, because I go to a school that has academies, one of our academies was um, like cut because of budget cuts and it was the Creative and Performing Arts Academy and that definitely hurt a lot of our students. Um, and I even use art as an outlet. So yeah, just simply by actually investing um, and divesting from other places that we necessarily don't need to be investing so much money in. If I can share what, what we did in Miranda Valley, and this can be done, and it's been done in many districts throughout the state, is uh, having a strategic plan for the arts. And I think that is a critical piece so that the district focus on providing arts education to students at all levels. So we have a strategic plan. And then as part of the strategic plan was to create certain positions throughout the school district so that every area is covered and every discipline is offered. And that is a, a, a VAPA a coordinator, visual and performing arts coordinator that oversees the entire district's arts activities. And that maintains the communication amongst all the teachers, all the arts teachers, music teachers, dance teachers, et cetera, so that there is a, a, an, an ongoing an effort throughout the entire district to provide services to every single student, addressing those uh, potential equity issues. Every student has the opportunity to experience any art any class in arts that they like, they want to do. So we are expanding the programs. We are including more students. We are adding more positions. And we continue offering the services so that all students have the opportunity. And that comes along, uh, that comes because of the strategic plan in the district. Absolutely. I think strategic pl planning and funding go hand in hand. Um, and often are like key steps or like key um, aspects of like arts education or, or the discussions around arts education that are often left out in school board meetings. Um, and then our, our next question, yeah, kind of goes in line with that and either of you can answer this, but what are important deadlines in this work? Yeah, since we're talking about the LCAT, I think it is important for, for uh, students and parents to be familiar Did we lose Jesus? Yes, okay, that's not just me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm sure he'll reconnect. So Ishtaka, maybe we can move to the next question. We'll circle back to Jesus once he logs back on. For sure, okay, got it. Um, all right, so uh, in that case, our next question is, do you see the power of the arts as a way to engage students, improve attendance and involve the community? And Stephanie, if you could please answer this question, I would appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I say yes. I have always been involved with art since I was a kid. Um, in the fifth grade, I joined a poetry club and it was life changing. I wrote about like struggles in my community and it definitely got me involved um, in my own community and opened my eyes to a new world. So I think definitely the arts engages students and the community. Um, I totally agree with that. As somebody who's also been engaged with arts for a really long time, they've definitely like improved my mental health. They've given me an outlet of expression um, and definitely encouraged me to like keep attending school. Like my photography right class right now is absolutely amazing. And I love getting to come to that um, every other day. Um, do we know if we have Jesus back? Not yet, not yet. So maybe we can just hop in and speak just briefly about uh, the timeline. Um, so the the LCAP document is updated in the spring and it's resubmitted to the County Office of Education, typically at the end of June. Um, Cordelia, hop in here too, if you have additional deadlines to add. So this means that 
Um, the, the winter and the spring are really key moments for advocacy, and it is actually the this timeline and the deadlines related to LCAP are really driving this program and this series. So this, this first event is really about um, sort of getting a better, here's Jesus, he's coming in, but getting an understanding of what is already in your LCAP. And then as Alexia will tell you a bit more at the end, we will have another webinar event in January that will sort of touch more on the outreach and engagement pieces, which was something that, that Jesus touched on. And then in March, we will have a the third part in, in our three-part series will be about speaking up, showing up, how to really be an effective advocate during this key moment in the spring when the, the document is being updated and, um, and finalized. Jesus, I, ju I just hopped in on that, the question that you got right before you froze about deadlines, but do you wanna say anything more about that? I just shared the, the spring deadline, but from your point of view, is there, um, are there other key moments in the, the cycle that everyone should be aware of? Well, thank you. My apologies, my, my signal dropped, but, you know, looking at deadlines, uh, you have to, again, I was mentioning the LCAP deadlines to make sure that the uh, information is submitted in time and, and uh, uh, when time comes for the design of the strategic plan, the budget, the LCAP, and all those different elements, and then to make sure that there is an, there's an oversight, there's a monitoring, there's accountability, because whatever it goes in the LCAP, the district has to comply with that, because that's the request from the community and the district has to do what is in the LCAP. So it is important for uh, the community, to, the parents, the students to be involved in that process and to make sure that they understand when, when uh, the district says, no, we cannot do this. What is the reason why the district is saying no? Is it really a no because they wanna do it or because they cannot do it? So uh, that accountability should be there. So deadlines are critical throughout the entire year. So we need to keep an eye on the calendar. The, the websites on the school districts usually uh, list the deadlines uh, where when people need to submit information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesus, for being able to come back and, and respond to that question. We really appreciate it. Um, and the final question um, from the registration, um, at least, is what is the secret sauce for a compelling school board presentation? And I feel like both of you could totally respond to this as well. Um, I can, I can tell you what's compelling for me and for my colleagues in the school board in our district. Every time we hear the voice of a student, we listen very carefully. And the students are going to tell us exactly what they want, exactly what they need, and what is it that they need to be successful. And that's what's important. And when they say that they need the arts to be successful, then we have to put attention and we have to make a commitment. We have to work on our strategic plan to make sure that we include the arts that we include the arts in the LCAP and that we also look at our, our district values, our goals, and uh, <clears throat> the goals of the entire community. Because once the strategic plan and the LCAP are in place, we have to remember that there was a lot of input from the community and the students. So that's the community goal, that's the community, that's the student's goal. So we have to pay attention. So when the student comes to the board meeting and tells us in three minutes that they need a dance class, we're going to put attention to that. That's that's the most thing voice, and how they do it at the board meeting. You know, it doesn't have to be a very elaborated uh, speech. Just tell us you know, we need to dance because this is what is going to uh, make uh, give, uh, make me successful. And also, you know, there's a lot of activity in the, in, throughout the entire district: performances, uh, plays, and concerts. And uh, I tend to attend as much as I can. So when I see the students performing, that is just a, an amazing way for me to say, you know, I, I have to do something for the students because they deserve it. Last thing that I want to say, and forgive, uh, forgive me for taking so much time, we're building a performing arts center in Moreno Valley, at the Moreno Valley High School, and it's almost completed. We're going to try to open it perhaps in January, February, but I can tell you that building, uh, I wanted to make sure the building was there along with my colleagues too. But I can tell you uh, that building is not for me, it's not for my colleagues, it's for the students. And we want to make sure they have the building because the building is already shining without them. So when they are in there, 
the building is going to shine way much brighter. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, Stephanie, would you like to add anything to that response or? I think that was a, well, yeah, well responded. Awesome, all right. Um, with that, I think we can move on to any questions that are in the chat. Um, <laughs> we have, how do we clone Jesus? <laughs> that's that's heartfelt. Um, are there any questions that I missed that are that I'm not unable to see right now, or what do we think? What are we thinking? Nothing yet. It looks like we hit most of uh, most folks' questions they put into the the registration, and we covered them. So if there aren't any additional questions, last call on questions, I'll hand it, Alexia will close us out. Thank you so much, Ishtaka, for that expert facilitation. Appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you to our speakers as well for participating. It was really great hearing all of your responses. Oops, Alexia, you're muted. Somebody had thank to do you it. So much. You, you were the one today. <laughs> Got this. So what's up next? Um, as Adelaide said before, uh, in January, we have the Arts Ed Advocacy Cycle Part 2, which will focus on outreach and engagement. So please stay tuned for that. We have all of your email addresses um, via registration link. So we will be sending out the date once we solidify that. Um, and then we also have a LCFF and LCAP watch list. We compiled this list of YouTube videos that are um, really great at just explaining what we talked about today, LCFF and LCAP, and that's also available in Spanish as well. And we will be doing a follow-up email with the various resources that we shared in this presentation, as long, along with the presentation itself and a video of the presentation and all of our speakers and everyone that was here today. So I just wanna thank everyone for attending and thank our partners, Arts for LA, California State PTA, AABA, thank you so much. And to all of our wonderful guest speakers, thank you for your time and your knowledge. Uh, we very much appreciate all of that. So with that, I do believe we have come to a close. So thank you so much. Just one Adelaide. more thank you to throw in there. Thank you to Heidi. Thank you to Sagrario for making this program accessible to, to the Spanish speakers as well. Appreciate you being here. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening.